We'll see how it works. Can we start? Can we start our session? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good. Good afternoon, good evening. I was wondering on uh, which, which language would be most appropriate, but uh, bet between French and English. Uh, so that, sorry? Franglais. Franglais, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll be, we'll be, okay. Maneuvering between the two languages. Uh, I think those who can, we will do it then in, in English and those who cannot uh, in French, or those who have the two languages move from one to the other, jump from one to the other without any problem. I am sure that uh, those who um, um, needed uh, these uh, earphones got them from the, the reception. I'm Kanisha Skanangiri. I come from Amka, and um, I have uh, gotten the privilege to be chosen for, uh, to be the chair of this session, and I thank the organizers. I wish to welcome you all uh, to this very important session on financing architecture, uh, where we will talk of investment needs, financial data, funding streams, and financing mechanisms to meet Africa's sanitation targets. Uh, I think this is a very important uh, uh, topic of discussion uh, in different circles now. The sanitation movement is growing very fast, Technocrats are talking about it. Planners, policymakers are very keen to see that Africa moves forward. During these uh, two last days, I was with uh, policymakers, ministers, and uh, all what they want is not to be at the tail when we reach 2030. And when it comes to evaluating the progress countries have made towards the targets on sanitation. And they want to put everything it requires to move forward. They were talking of technologies, talking of uh, policy environment, and uh, about the financing, but uh, that is, of course, the most complicated thing when it comes to discussing with them, that is the big barrier to which they, they bang every time they come uh, with a lot of commitments on the progress they want to make. But all in all, I think we are not discouraged. In that sphere of policymakers, they still think that during the 10, 12, one, uh, 11 years, remaining for us to reach the deadline that they will make very substantive progress in servicing, giving these services to their people. South Africa offered to share the technologies and the progress they are making, and other countries are very much open to um, learn from others within the continent and outside the continent. For many, for the politicians and policymakers, they think, of course, money is one of those very serious problems which need to be tackled. And they have many priorities when it comes to the national budget. But uh, others think that uh, money is not the biggest problem, that actually money is available but that we need to be very ingenious, very innovative in how we approach the issue of funding 
so that we can go to where money is and uh, bring it to where it needed. It is needed to make the changes we, we need. So we are moving from thinking that all the monies will come from donors and giving more effort to mobilizing funds from uh, countries, from ourselves in our communities, more funds to transform the uh, sanitation environment. We need also to look at the private sector. They have money, but they need some pieces of uh, legislation which will enable them to do what they have to do. They need also some financial tools to make sure that their money is not lost in the process. There is a need to establish confidence and trust between the policy makers, the public sector, and uh, those private sector uh, people so that uh, the effort can converge to the same uh, thing. At AMCA level, that is African Minister's Council on Water, which deals also with sanitation. Sanitation is one of the pillars of our strategy, and it came from countries themselves. So at country level, water supply um, and sanitation are being considered as key areas of priority and meeting finance ministers so that uh, we can have an increase of the commitment from countries is becoming one of uh, the rallying point when we meet with ministers, when we meet with the African Development Bank, when we meet uh, with African Union at the Commission, we think that that is one thing which will help to unblock some of those uh, bottlenecks bottleneck we still have at country level. And um, in uh, the General Assembly, where we meet with all the ministers in charge of water and sanitation in Africa, last week in Kigali, they also said that it is very important to also involve head of state and government in this process so that they can give a new impetus to this area of water and sanitation in another summit, special one, or special session on water and sanitation, which will come 10 years after the Sharm Sheh declaration, which gave much push to this area. As AMCAO Secretariat, we are working on those and try to see if we can get them concretized uh, next year or so. We believe that uh, that will be one of, uh, if it happens, it will be one of the success uh, of uh, our effort to mobilize all the stakeholders to this. Uh, and indeed, the message which will be conveyed uh, to them uh, will be generated from all these uh, discussions. Another thing which um, uh, came out, the discussions we, had, we held yesterday and today, is that ministers would like to see uh, some quantitative studies which show the correlation between sanitation and health, between sanitation and economic growth, so that they can be able to convince their counterparts in charge of finance. I know some of uh, our partners have been working on those uh, types of studies, and uh, we will come to them when time come, uh, comes so that we can have the message to convey uh, to uh, those uh, high-level forum we want uh, uh, to reach out to. It is um, a big pleasure for us as um, Africans to see the effort um, which are uh, is developed by our partners, especially the UNICEF and the WHO, in contributing to responding to all these questions policymakers in Africa are asking themselves 
and calling for answers. Through the session we are having today, some of those uh, findings, tools, approaches will be shared with the representative of different players on African continent in the area of sanitation. I'm inviting all of you uh, to follow keenly the presentations, to ask questions, to get emails and contacts of those experts who will be talking with us, build certain relationships which will continue, which will allow to continue the engagement so that we get more understanding on it and be able to apply all those tools to evaluate the needs we have to fill the gap in the financing of sanitation in our respective countries, different approaches to gather the money we need. Sometimes we will need to use very innovative ways and talk to politicians and other people, other groups, but we need to do it because that is what will, it will take to get us to uh, the target we want to have. So when we will be back home, we expect you guys to apply all the tools you will have gotten here for uh, the progress we want. This is a learning uh, platform, I mean a, learn a learning op opportunity, an interactive uh, opportunity we have, and I wish that it is very productive, very successful for everyone who has made it here in this uh, room. I thank you, organizers. I thank you uh, all for this session. Now, allow me to call in some of the presenters who will be entertaining, I mean, uh, discussing with us, sharing presentations. We will have a number of them. We will have one from um, uh, UNICEF, a wash specialist, Mr. Sahir Kemo. He will be the first one to come to touch the issues of investment needed. We will have Fiona uh, Gore from GLASS, WHO, who will talk, and Didier Aleli, who will talk about uh, TrackFin, one of the tools which is uh, uh, being used and which I think will be very useful to understand and apply to our respective contexts. We will have also Mr. Sheh Mohammed, um, and uh, who will talk of other aspects and give some experiences of how they approach the funding of different areas of um, uh, sanitation in our uh, neighbors country, Senegal. We will have uh, Guy Hutton, who will also uh, present us uh, some other interesting experiences, then we'll give you the floor for questions and answers. I think that is, uh, will be very enriching before we uh, conclude and sum up what we will have, we have learned here. So that is the program. I will not ask you as uh, we do usually if you adopt it, I will go immediately to implement it. So <laughs> let me Guy, th this is a bit complicated. Ah, oh, it jumped. Huh? But I think uh, to come back to this, this will come back again uh, during the presentations. But this will be the framework, I think, which is very important to understand because it has the three major areas. Uh, I didn't make any effort to have it change. Uh, we will talk about the needs. We will talk about the money we need and uh, how we can get that money. Those are the three major things. What do we need? And um, at the bottom, I think the responsibility we'll have will be mainly as AMCO and other players, is that we need to understand the policies, the planning, and the institutional arrangement, the regulatory framework we need to put in place, how we'll monitor the progress, 
and then, yeah, quantifying, evaluating, and costing the needs is one of the challenge, and you will agree with me that many countries in Africa cannot, for now, tell you we need this amount of money for us to reach the SDGs, and that is the effort we need to do now. So let me not uh, take too much of your time and call in Mr. Sahir Kemo, WASH a specialist from UNICEF Regional Office in Eastern, East and Southern Africa, who will talk about investment needs. You are welcome. Hello, good. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is uh, Sa Kemo, as he rightly pointed out, a WASH specialist, regional office, Eastern South and Africa region for UNICEF. Um, I will make the presentation on investment needs for basic and safely managed sanitation in Africa. Um, we've all been talking in the last couple of days, how do we get to 2030? So many countries have got targets. Um, some countries have up to 2020. Some countries are saying 2025. But how much do we need to get to 2025. If it's 2030, how much do we need in terms of dollars to get to 2030? So this is actually what I am going to show. And I feel a few illustrations of some of the tools that have been used in some, in some of the countries. Okay, uh, for the benefit of our colleagues that uh, are francophone, um, this particular slide will be in French, um, but don't be too excited. The rest of the presentation will be in English. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a recalibration of the regional cost to reach uh, SDG 6.2. This is basically uh, an estimate based on the World Bank 2016 global study, uh, which focused mainly on uh, how to get to 6.2 and considerations for basic sanitation, basic hygiene, and safely managed sanitation. Um, it also hinged on updated coverage from the JMP 2017 report. It also looked at the AMCAO sub-regional uh, baseline report and the methodologies and methods that were used for this study included um, first-time users, and the technologies included wet as well as dry. That brings on board uh, FSM, the need for us to work together. Uh, equal population trenches served over the 15 years, over 15 years, uh, but if we are looking at 2030, we have only 11 years. And the cost components include capital, software, and O and M. Um, looking at, before we start talking about the money, we want to start, first start talking about the people we are planning for. How many people are we talking about? The total African population in 2019 uh, is 
one billion and eight. Urban is four four hundred and twenty four hundred and two million. The rural population, as you can see, constitutes sixty percent. So we have more of our clientele actually in the rural. And there's going to be a population increase by two hundred and eighty million between now and 2030. So this is the situation we are dealing with. And between now and 2030, we'll have definitely new bonds. And you can see the, the spread across the regions, North Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, Eastern Africa, and Southern Africa. Um, now, the African population without basic sanitation in 2016, that was towards the end of the MDGs, that needed coverage by 2030, uh, is reflected in this slide. Due to the continued population growth, the number needing um, new coverage is almost equal to the current population. So it's not getting better in any form. For basic sanitation, Africa needs annually $3.3 billion for urban and $2 billion for rural areas to meet the capital cost. For safely managed, we will need $5 billion for urban and $5 billion for rural, in addition to the basic sanitation cost. So if you add the 2.2 and the 3 point, the 2 million, 2 billion and the 3.2 billion to this cost, we are talking of almost 16 billion for SDG 26.2. If we are to reach, if Africa is to reach 2030, with open defecation free, safely managed, basic, uh, we need 16 billion in total. And you can see the spread. At the tip of the bars, you will see the green. That is looking at basic sanitation because the story is not complete if we don't have hygiene incorporated into the analysis. So 16 billion covers uh, basic sanitation, safely managed, and basic hygiene. Now, to make it even more difficult, uh, this is an example from urban basic sanitation in West Africa. The more infrastructure we provide, the more the need for us to look at O&M. So the equation, again, is never complete, especially for urban sanitation, if we don't talk about operation and maintenance. Again, this is where we need fecal sludge managers. Now, the capital cost, if you look at the GDP for Africa, the capital cost we are talking about here is 0.9% of Africa's GDP for 6.2, which reduces to 0.33% for basic. When O&M costs are added, the SDG 6.2 costs 1.6 of Africa's regional product. Uh, you can see Eastern Africa is still showing the highest because in the beginning it was showing the highest population across the regions. So it actually goes with the numbers. Now, this is the biggest question. How can countries that haven't, as I mentioned initially, a lot of countries have gone through this. They've been able to asserting what is required. Some countries have roadmaps. 
they've been able to establish what is required for them to reach 2030? Or what is the gap that is needed to cover in order to reach 2030? So if countries uh, are here that have not done this assessment, I think we have some suggestions as, may, as uh, suggested by the, as mentioned by the chairman. There are tools out there, a lot of tools. Some of the tools are being used across uh, the globe. And one of those tools is actually the SWA costing tool that was developed by World Bank and UNICEF. The other tools include a OECD's feasibility, feasible model and the IRC wash cost budgeting tools. But for the purpose of this, uh, discussions, probably we want to just focus on the SWA costing tools. Now, as I mentioned, since 2017, uh, these tools have been used in over 40 countries, the SWA uh, costing tool. It's very simple tool, Excel-based, very user-friendly, you can adapt it at every level, sub-regional, national level, it's usable. Uh, all you probably you might need to do is to change some of the parameters. You either change the technology or the cost recovery, or you look at uh, the target for against 2030, what do you want to cover, or the duration of the hardware, so it's very, very useful. You change those parameters, you get your product coming out of the analysis. Um, there is a link there. For those of us that will want to follow up from this presentation, you can always speak on that link and uh, you can use it. You can use it at national level, at sub-national level. Now, um, the tool can give you multiple output automatically based on your input, based on your parameters that you change. It can give you, like uh, this slide shows, um, maintaining services for, service for, for those served in 2015 and then um, reaching the underserved between 2015 and 2030. All of these analyses, I don't want to go into the details, but if you want to try it, you go to the link. You can get, uh, based on your input, you can get an analysis coming up like this. You have multiple tool outputs as well that looks at um, various components, uh, basic water, safely managed water supply, basic sanitation, safely managed, um, the few elements that are not included here based on the input, um, you see on this slide, it actually gives you the gap. If you do your homework very well, you enter the data as required. It can give you the financial gap that you need to cover and reach your target. 2030, if 2030 is your target. If you set your roadmap says you want to reach ODF by 2029 or 2028, as the case may be, you will get um, um, products like this. Uh, in, this includes your current financial position. You have to make provision for that as well because you need to subtract that from the total you will get. That gives you, now concluding, um, the overall investment needs divided equally between rural and urban. So we really don't have option here. Um, you have to decide. It's either rural or urban, but they have equal weight. The rural area, more current on the south population and urban areas, migration between, from rural to urban. 
Uh, meeting SDGs target 6.2 requires growth in funding. We do not have region-wide data on current funding levels that extend access to the underserved. And of course, country and sub-national level estimates are also needed as part of the financial strategy. So, get the ball rolling, use the tool, and see what type of analysis you will come up with for your country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we go immediately to the next presentation. Keep your questions for uh, the last. I'm uh, immediately inviting Dr. Fiona Go, uh, GLASS team lead, WHO, and uh, Didier Lely, WHO consultant. You're welcome. Bonjour à tous. On propose de passer en français. Donc, je vous laisse le temps de mettre les, les écouteurs. We need to have a bit of equity for the interpreters, right? Donc on va parler en français pour cette session. Alors, je vous laisse le temps de prendre vos écouteurs. Euh, merci beaucoup, Dr. Euh, Canisius Canengere, pour cette introduction. Euh, J'ai le plaisir de, donc, de me présenter. Je m'appelle Fiona Gore, je travaille à l'OMS. Euh, au siège et euh, je m'occupe de la coordination de l'initiative GLASS. Le GLASS, c'est le Global Analysis and Assessment of Drinking Water and Sanitation. Euh, également, dans cette initiative, et on va l'expliquer, euh, comment le track fin et euh, le développement des comptes WASH qui sont basés sur les comptes de la santé euh, et on va vous expliquer tout ça. Comme on fait les choses bien, j'ai le plaisir aussi d'être là avec Didier qui fait partie de l'équipe. Didier qui est basé à Nairobi et qui, qui donne de l'assistance technique à pas mal de pays, surtout en Afrique. Et donc, je sais qu'on a très peu de temps, Didier, c'est correct Oui, très peu de temps. Bon, Guy, tu as le droit... De, de nous arrêter et de nous faire des signes. Si on te voit bouger, on va comprendre. Mais bon, je vais vous dire une chose. Moi, je viens de Suisse, on est assez discipliné. Par contre, il est français. Alors, ça va sans dire, hein, on a bien vu aux nouvelles ces derniers temps, les Français, ils sont un peu moins disciplinés que les Suisses. Mais bon, c'est bien, vous, les Français, ils s'expriment. Nous, en Suisse, on a un peu de peine à s'exprimer. Mais bon, on y arrive. Alors, pour démarrer ces dix prochaines minutes, j'ai le plaisir de vous parler donc de cette initiative qu'on appelle le TRACFIN, qui est vraiment euh, la base pour développer par les pays et les gouvernements les comptes, euh, les comptes WASH. Donc, je crois qu'on est tous au courant. Le, le secteur WASH est très, très fragmenté. On a beaucoup de ministères qui travaillent ensemble ou peut-être un peu moins. Donc les données sont dans divers, les sources de données euh, sont vraiment dans plusieurs endroits et c'est très très difficile. Donc l'idée c'était vraiment d'essayer d'adresser de, de, ce, ce problème. Donc l'initiative GLASS a commencé il y a dix ans et on s'est très vite rendu compte que les données financières dans la section euh, où on collectait des informations sur euh, le, le financement et les finances euh, au niveau WASH, manquaient. Donc, juste, et j'ai rencontré quelqu'un du gouvernement du Sénégal hier qui me dit, mais expliquez-moi la différence euh, et comment le, 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 le track fin s'insère au sein du GLAS. Donc le GLAS, c'est vraiment l'aperçu des flux financiers. Le track fin permet de faire une étude approfondie et de, de, de vraiment collecter ce, ces informations en profondeur. Alors, on va résumer ça très simplement, vu qu'on a très, très peu de temps, mais il y a vraiment quatre questions 
fondamental auquel on essaye de, de répondre euh, avec le, le track fin. Donc là, comme vous voyez, les diapos sont en anglais. Mais les quatre questions sont quel est le montant total des dépenses dans le secteur Ensuite, comment les fonds sont-ils répartis entre les différents services et types de services WASH La troisième question est qui paye pour les services WASH Et la dernière question sont quelles sont les entités, quelles sont les principales entités euh, et les voies de financement du secteur WASH Et quelle est leur part des dépenses et je vais très rapidement, je vous ai dit, j'étais disciplinée, je vais très rapidement passer la parole à Didier, qui est vraiment notre expert sur le terrain. Mais pour vous donner une idée, il y a beaucoup d'informations sur cette diapo. On a déposé à l'entrée des flyers, des, des brochures qui résument le statut des différentes mises en œuvre par les gouvernements de l'initiative TRACFIN, qui a commencé en 2012. Donc c'était vraiment quelques années après le début du GLAS, quand on s'est rendu compte qu'il y avait vraiment, il y avait une, une, un, il manquait des données, il y avait des lacunes dans, dans les données. Donc on a commencé en 2012. On a en tout 16 pays actuellement qui sont qui ont ou sont en train de mettre en œuvre le track fin dans le monde, dont 11 pays africains. Et tout ça, c'est résumé sur les feuilles qu'on vous a distribuées. Donc, 9 ont déjà complété au moins un cycle, dont on a les résultats, et très prochainement, on aura un dixième pays, qui sera le Sénégal. Euh, L'autre chose, c'est qu'on a également, c'était 5 pays, ont déjà fait plus d'un cycle. Donc après un premier cycle, le gouvernement est, qui ont entrepris de mettre en œuvre TrackFin et développer, développer des comptes WASH, et ont, ont vraiment compris l'utilité des données qui pouvaient être utilisées dans la prise de décision, ont entrepris un deuxième cycle WASH, et dont certains pays sont dans un troisième cycle, comme le Ghana, le Mali, et d'autres entrevoient également le Burkina dans le futur de, de faire un, un troisième cycle, un deuxième ou un troisième. J'aimerais peut-être faire une dernière remarque, par rapport aux partenaires. Je ne vais pas rentrer en détail, mais une des choses clés avec ces initiatives, c'est que le soutien des partenaires a été absolument incroyable. Que ce soit d'autres partenaires comme la Banque mondiale qui a aidé le gouvernement tunisien à mettre en œuvre le track fin en Tunisie, l'UNICEF, l'UNICEF est un, une autre organisation qui a été absolument clé dans la mise en œuvre de TRACFIN au niveau financier, tant financier que soutien technique au Mali, par exemple, au Ghana. Et on a d'autres exemples où euh, l'UNICEF a, a été un partenaire clé. Mais il y en a également d'autres. L'USAID, par son programme WASHFIN, est aussi en train d'aider la mise en œuvre de, de TRACFIN euh, dans certains pays, dont le Kenya, et je vois les représentants du gouvernement kenyan devant nous. Euh, mais on a également d'autres partenaires, WaterAid et IRC, et on se rallie tous pour utiliser et soutenir les pays à mettre en œuvre TrackFin. Voilà, j'ai dit qu'on n'était pas complètement disciplinés, mais quand même un peu. Didier, je te laisse présenter quelques résultats. Merci Fiona. Je vais, je vais essayer d'être encore plus discipliné. Je suis français, mais quand même, euh, j'ai passé dix ans en Suisse dernièrement. Et, euh, ok. Quelques, quelques, je vais vous présenter quelques grands enseignements. On va, ne on va pas rentrer dans tout, tous les détails. Quelques grands enseignements de l'expérience qu'on a eue sur les euh, 16 pays que tu disais, euh, et, et en particulier sur l'Afrique. Ce qui ressort très, très clairement, et ça, pour cette semaine, c'est vraiment le point important, c'est qu'on a, dans les dépenses, dans les financements du secteur, on a 5 à 6 fois... Plus de données, plus de financement dans le secteur de l'eau que dans le secteur de l'assainissement, dans le sous-secteur de l'assainissement. Ça, c'est très clair. Je pense que tout le monde savait qu'il y avait un grand, une grande différence. Mais là, on commence à le chiffrer. Et une chose qui est intéressante, c'est qu'on constate, quand on regarde la Tunisie, le Brésil et le Maroc, quand on compare avec ces points verts, qui correspondent aux résultats sur le taux de couverture en assainissement, on constate que des pays qui sont quand même très hauts, 
continue à avoir une proportion très importante de financement dans l'assainissement. Ça veut dire que les dépenses d'assainissement, pour eux, sont quand même très importantes. C'est une grande différence avec les autres pays qui, eux, ont un taux d'accès moins élevé. Un autre enseignement qui nous semble vraiment très, très important, ça a été une grande découverte, enfin une grande découverte. Oui, on peut le dire. On entendait souvent dans beaucoup de pays des partenaires, des bailleurs de fonds qui disaient « on en a marre » de soutenir le secteur. Si ce n'est pas les bailleurs de fonds, il n'y a pas de financement dans le secteur. Eh bien non. Quels sont les, pro... euh, les... Pardon. Voilà. Quels sont les premiers bailleurs de fonds Quels sont les premiers financeurs du secteur Ce sont les usagers. Hop, pardon, encore une fois. Les usagers, ici, c'est le cas du Mali, où on voit que on a plus de 60% qui, des financements du secteur qui viennent des usagers. C'est considérable. Les, viennent ensuite les bailleurs de fonds et le gouvernement, avec les autorités locales, régionales ou nationales. Je dirais ça, ça va varier beaucoup d'un pays à l'autre, sur la proportion entre la répartition entre le gouvernement et, euh, et les bailleurs de fonds. On a une grande différence au Ghana, par exemple, il euh, y a beaucoup plus de financements qui viennent des, des bailleurs de fonds. Les ONG, on voit que c'est un chiffre relativement faible, mais en fait, on a du mal à récupérer les données des ONG. Dans tous les pays, on a eu des difficultés. Un autre enseignement, et ça rejoint un petit peu la première présentation qu'on avait tout à l'heure, c'est l'importance... De, euh, de la, du fonctionnement et de la maintenance. C'est là que les plus grosses dépenses viennent. On voit que euh, 5 dollars sur 10 sont destinés à, euh, à la, au fonctionnement et à la maintenance. C'est ce qui a été calculé un petit peu dans le, le costing tool, où ça a été rajouté par la suite en disant il ne faut pas oublier cette partie-là. Parce qu'une fois qu'on a réalisé l'infrastructure, il faut la faire fonctionner. Si jamais on n'a pas mis assez d'argent, on va avoir un problème. Et là, ça ramène à une question très très importante pour les gouvernements, c'est est-ce qu'on prévoit assez d'argent pour l'entretien et la maintenance Et ça, c'est vraiment un point crucial si on veut s'assurer à ce que le service soit durable. Euh, pardon. Maintenant, l'importance du suivi financier c'est de savoir où on en est, mais aussi de savoir où est-ce qu'on en est par rapport aux engagements que les États ont pris, tant au niveau national qu'au niveau international. Et l'exemple typique, ici, c'est euh, la déclaration d'Ungor. La déclaration d'Ungor, comme tout le monde le sait, à l'intérieur, il y a une partie sur la finance qui dit que les dépenses pour l'hygiène et l'assainissement doivent atteindre 0,5% du PIB d'ici... 2020. Une chose qu'on constate, c'est qu'on a du mal à l'évaluer parce qu'on n'a pas les données financières complètes de l'hygiène et de l'assainissement. On peut avoir des données sur les dépenses de l'État, on peut avoir des données des dépenses euh, des bailleurs de fonds, mais les usagers, on n'a souvent aucune idée, et en particulier sur l'hygiène. Euh, au Burkina Faso, le Burkina a été le premier pays à intégrer dans le processus TRACFIN l'hygiène dans, dans le suivi. Et c'est là qu'on a été, pour la première fois, et il n'y a, a que le Mali qui, qui l'a fait en deuxième, en deuxième phase, euh, c'est la première fois qu'on a pu calculer où est-ce qu'on en était en termes de dépenses totales pour l'hygiène et l'assainissement. Et on voit que pour le, le Burkina, on, est, on était en 2015 un total de dépenses par rapport au GDP, au, euh, oui, au, au PIB à 0,14% en fait. Comment on va pouvoir améliorer ce suivi Ça, ça va être un point très très important. Comment les, les, les pays vont pouvoir le faire 
dans les améliorations, dans les choses qu'on a pu initier, et ce n'est pas uniquement, le, pas uniquement Trackfin qui a pu le faire, c'est le travail qu'on a pu faire avec les États, c'est quels ont été les changements au niveau institutionnel. Au Ghana, on s'est rendu compte, avec euh, Trackfin, mais aussi avec des études complémentaires qu'on a conduites euh, avec l'UNICEF, l'OMS, euh, IRC aussi avait conduit des études similaires, c'est euh, que les dépenses... Euh, on avait un problème de connaissance des dépenses réelles des gouvernements locaux dans l'assainissement liquide. En fait, on avait estimé que 15% allait des transferts du niveau national au niveau des gouvernements locaux allaient pour l'assainissement liquide. En fait, on s'est rendu compte, après ces études, que ce n'était pas le cas. Une chose qui a été essentielle, qui est vraiment très très bonne, c'est que le ministère des Finances a décidé de désagréger davantage le suivi et la budgétisation des dépenses pour séparer les dépenses dans le domaine de l'eau, dans le domaine de l'assainissement solide et dans le domaine de l'assainissement liquide. Euh, et ça, Tony, Tony est peut-être dans la salle, ou euh, Nair, tu pourras peut-être intervenir tout à l'heure pour, pour en parler un peu plus. Une autre expérience, c'est le Mali, euh, les résultats de Trackfin ont montré qu'on avait beaucoup, un, un grand déficit, jusqu'à 50% sur les cinq dernières, dernières années, euh, par rapport au programme national euh, eau potable et assain, euh, de l'eau potable. C'était vraiment un enseignement, on en était loin des, des programmations, et les résultats ont été présentés en conseil de, en conseil de cabinet, pour présenter au gouvernement où on en était, en particulier au ministre des Finances. Et, euh, et lors de la dernière revue sectorielle en 2018, le, et, et Drissa, euh, euh, du conseiller technique du, du ministère de l'Environnement, pourra en dire deux mots également tout à l'heure, euh, il y a eu décision d'institutionnaliser le suivi de façon à ce que c'est pas, on n'a pas besoin d'une photographie aujourd'hui, on a besoin d'un suivi régulier. C'est dans le temps qu'on a besoin de suivre ça. Euh, dernière diapo, très très vite. Je voulais dire juste, on a de plus en plus de demandes de Trackfin, enfin, pour un, euh, mettre en œuvre Trackfin, trackfin dans d'autres dans pays ou renouveler l'expérience. Et euh, ce qui est important dans tout ça, c'est un petit peu ce que disait Fiona, c'est... C'est un bien commun, presque, Trackfin. Ce n'est pas pour l'OMS, surtout pas. C'est d'abord pour les pays. Et n'importe qui peut le mettre en œuvre au niveau du terrain, au niveau des, au niveau des pays. Oui, je vais, je vais m'arrêter là. Mais ce qui est important aussi, c'est qu'on va continuer à apprendre de l'expérience de chaque pays pour, euh, pour renforcer la méthodologie et l'approche. Désolé, j'ai été un peu, un peu plus long que, que prévu. Merci. Je suis désolé. On m'a donné une tâche très difficile, celle de me lever quand euh, quelqu'un approche la fin de son temps. Et je pense que c'est très intéressant. Je suis heureux que... Uh, oh, je continue en français uh, je, je, je pense que c'est une très bonne chose de voir que certains pays avancent plus rapidement que d'autres. Et là, ça nous donne... Uh, à, je pense, cette information, une des informations que l'on a ici, c'est qu'on sait où on peut aller frapper pour avoir des informations et peut-être aussi une aide, une assistance technique, technique pour savoir comment appliquer cet outil à nos, à nos situations euh, dans, 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 les, dans les différents pays. Je ne vais pas avancer plus dedans. Vous aurez des questions et réponses. Et puis, vous identifiez ces dames et messieurs à, qui ont parlé pour que vous exploitiez au maximum leur savoir pendant la semaine. Maintenant, je prends le plaisir d'appeler M. Che, Mohamed. Ah, here he is. You're welcome. Bonjour, je m'appelle Cheikh Mohamed Fadel Fall. Je suis chargé de suivre l'évaluation au niveau de la cellule de coordination du ministère de l'Irique au Sénégal. Bon, Didier m'a presque marché sur la langue. Tout ce que je voulais dire, il a presque dit avec M. Sarr. 
Mais je vais donner l'expérience du Sénégal par rapport à l'initiative TACFIN et euh, le Fonds Bleu qui est en cours d'élaboration. Donc ça, c'est un petit rappel sur les performances. Bon, le Sénégal se trouve dans la zone jaune, qui n'est pas la bonne zone. Donc en termes, en termes, en termes d'accès, pour euh, rappeler un peu les performances réalisées hein, au niveau urbain, dans l'assainissement, le taux d'accès est global est de 107% au Sénégal, ce qui est supérieur de 26 points par rapport à la moyenne sous-régionale Afrique et inférieur de 16% par rapport à la moyenne mondiale. Donc, pour la défécation à l'air libre, euh, le taux se situe à 4,3%. Donc, il y a des efforts qui doivent se faire. Donc, pour ce qui est du secteur euh, rural, on est à 42% pour l'accès amélioré, supérieur de 22 points par rapport à la moyenne régionale et de 8 points par rapport à la moyenne mondiale. Donc, comme on l'a dit, comme le DJ l'a dit tout à l'heure, pour l'objectif de la déclaration d'Angor, qui devait être de 0,5% euh, du PIB d'ici 2020 à mobiliser, au Sénégal actuellement, on est à 0,3% selon les données de 2016. Donc, ceci est dû souvent à des ponctions qui sont faites sur les budgets alloués au ministère ou bien à des lois respectives. Et pour le montant alloué à l'assainissement dans le budget de l'État, sur de, 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 à sur le budget total de l'État, on est à 0,1% en, en 2016. Ce qui reste assez faible. Donc, pour la répartition des dépenses par service, ce qui est, ces chiffres sont issus de l'étude TRACFIN financée par euh, euh, l'OMS. Donc, vous voyez bien que le secteur de l'eau potable est privilégié. Le secteur vient en première place. Et en deuxième place, on a l'assainissement qui vient avec, euh, accompagné aussi de, des services d'appui au secteur WASH, qui est assez faible. Et on, on peut remarquer qu'à partir de 2015, on a eu, euh, entre 2015 et 2016, on a eu euh, une chute entre euh, ce qui est mobilisé en termes de fonds par rapport. Euh, on a 46 millions en 2015 et 43 millions en 2016 de mobilisés. Donc là, comme, comme au Mali, on disait tout à l'heure qu'au Mali, ils sont à 60% de prise en charge des services d'assainissement pour les usagers. Au Sénégal, on est à 56% et l'État est à 37%. Euh, les bailleurs de fonds et les autres partenaires, 6% et les ONG, 1%. Ici aussi, on a un problème de données pour vraiment déterminer la situation réelle. Donc, en termes de contraintes et de défis, donc, l'implication des couvertures locales reste vraiment euh, une réalité au Sénégal. Parce que les compétences ne sont toujours pas transférées de manière réelle, ce qui euh, bloque un peu l'avancement en termes de prise en charge des cultures locales par rapport au sous-secteur de l'assainissement. La gestion aussi des eaux pluviales est un, est un réel problème. Et l'implication aussi du secteur privé à travers les opérateurs est vraiment demandée. Nous avons aussi le financement de maintenance des ouvrages, le financement de l'exploitation, le financement des investissements et enfin la valorisation des sous-produits, la de la filière boue. Donc euh, les difficultés souvent pour l'urbain pour, pour en termes de mobilisation de financement, souvent c'est le taux de couverture des charges qui reste assez faible donc, et qui baisse d'année en année. Donc on peut noter qu'entre 2015 et 2017, on a connu 2% de baisse. On est passé de 85% à 81%. Et ça, vraiment, ça impacte la balance de l'ONAS sur le recouvrement. Maintenant, quel financement pour les objectifs de développement Là, on va parler de l'initiative euh, euh, Blue Fund. Donc, c'est les fonds bleus qu'on a adopté, que le président de la République du Sénégal a mis en exergue depuis 2016-2017. Donc, et dans la lettre de politique sectoriale du Sénégal, 2016-2025, il est ciblé d'avoir au moins 80% de taux d'accès amélioré à des services d'eau potable, 
l'assainissement des jeunes, adéquat d'ici 2025, passer à 100% de taux d'accès à des services gérés en toute sécurité d'ici 2030, euh, amener le taux de défécation en libre, à, 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 défécation en les libre à 0% en milieu urbain, atteindre au plus 10% en milieu rural d'ici 2025. Et enfin, le taux de couverture en ouvrage d'assainissement fonctionnel au niveau des écoles et des structures de santé atteindra au moins 90% d'ici 2025. Donc, pour mobiliser tout ce financement, l'État s'est engagé à travers les ODD, les objectifs de développement durable, la vision africaine de l'eau 2025, les engagements de l'Afrique Hassan d'Angor et le plan Sénégal émergent. Et tout ceci est évalué à 586 millions de dollars par an, soit 330 milliards CFA, et devrait couvrir les besoins en investissement pour fournir des services sécurisés à la population sénégalaise n'ayant pas encore accès à l'eau potable et à l'assainissement. Ceci est relatif à l'UNICEF UNICEF et ses marchands basés sur l'outil Excel de la Banque mondiale, qu'on avait présenté tout à l'heure. Donc, ce qui nécessite vraiment euh, euh, des moyens de financement innovants, d'où euh, euh, l'idée du fonds bleu, imaginé par le président de la République du Sénégal, Macky Sall, donc pour le dédier au secteur de, de l'eau pour l'accompagner à atteindre les, les, les ODD, particulièrement l'ODD 6. Donc les besoins colossaux du financement, l'augmentation des besoins sociaux en termes de gauche, les sources publiques qui sont assez très limitées, nécessitent un fonds bleu pour l'atteinte des objectifs. Donc l'initiative du fonds bleu vient euh, à peu près de l'idée du fonds bleu mondial. Et actuellement, l'étude est en cours au Sénégal et mon collègue de l'USAID peut-être va y apporter quelques éclaircissements après. Et en termes d'objectifs, d'ici 30, 2030, en plus des financements classiques, mobiliser 60 milliards de francs CFA par an au niveau national pour contribuer au financement inclusif de l'accès aux services d'eau potable et d'assainissement, en mettant le focus sur les ménages pauvres et en travaillant avec le secteur privé. Et on a comme enjeu euh, la vocation sociale, assurer sa prédité avec les activités générales de revenus à travers deux guichets. Un guichet social destiné aux investissements en assainissement en eau potable et un guichet privé destiné aux opérateurs privés et autres acteurs du secteur. Et pour l'identification du potentiel du fonds, l'objectif est d'apprécier tous les revenus pouvant être liés des services offerts en vue de les accroître d'évaluer le niveau de subvention croisée nécessaire à la couverture des activités, des charges de fonctionnement et d'investissement de toutes les activités, guichets social et guichets privé et confondus. Les capitaux propres aussi sont appelés. La subvention non remboursée à travers les transferts de fonds, les subventions et dons, les recettes fiscales et parafiscales, les fonds mobilisés sur les marchés financiers, comme le CD, la Caisse de dépôt et consignation, les recettes d'exploitation contre partie des populations, le remboursement du guichet privé, et enfin les revenus immobiliers et autres ressources, euh, ressources intérieures et externes. Autres ressources externes. Merci de votre aimable attention. Merci beaucoup. Uh, this is very interesting to see that uh, there is much progress and uh, this uh, roof and, uh, and the sources which I identified uh, here will certainly be a good uh, case to emulate by other African countries. I think I will call upon Dr. Guy Hutton. Uh, you are welcome. He is um, from UNICEF, senior WASH advisor, and he will make a presentation on this topic and later we'll have some questions and answers. Thank you very much. Is it easier to use this microphone? Yeah. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanangiri. Um, so, what I'm going to be speaking to is uh, we, we've learned about the costs, which are slightly scary, as we know. 
Um, and we um, are also starting to put together quality data on the financing available um, and seeing quite a considerable gap. And so um, this is hopefully this presentation will give us uh, some, some more hope that there are opportunities to close the f financing gap. And there are also, um, there are already many experiences. And so my presentation is quite short um, and I will be inviting uh, colleagues who've uh, agreed to make a short interventions from the floor just to give a sort of uh, one minute snapshot of a uh, financing mechanism happening in their country. So, so um, Dr. Kanangiri already presented this um, framework, um, which uh, the OECD had uh, published in 2010. And I don't think we've fully utilized this framework in our sector. So I'm, a, uh, I'm becoming an advocate of using this framework um, to better understand um, the relationship between investment needs, um, inv uh, financing available, and ways to cover the gap. Um, and um, I've made a rather unofficial addition to this, this diagram by adding uh, the, the, the blue box on the bottom just to recognize the importance of the enabling environment, um, the, the, the building blocks, the collaborative behaviors that uh, Sanitation and Waterfall Partnership has, uh, has published and, and we're, we're drawing on for, our, for understanding how to Im improve the, the wash situation. Um, so I'm gonna go through this framework uh, in a little bit more detail and uh, to show what we need. Um, so on the left side uh, of, the, of, the, of the diagram is the investment needs. And um, there's been quite a lot of, uh, there's a much better understanding now of what are the essential costs that we have to cover. So there's the, the uh, IRC's famous life cycle uh, cost analysis. Um, and, uh, and it identifies six parts of the pie that need to be financed. Here we've simplified it a little bit, um, and, and, and it's uh, essentially the investment costs, the capital maintenance, and the operating and preventive maintenance. Um, and uh, we, uh, as uh, Mr. Kemo presented earlier, we um, have some idea, and many countries have already done some rough estimations of the, um, the investment needs. Um, However, um, the purpose of the, the SWA tool that um, was applied over the last two years or so, the purpose of it was to raise the attention of, of countries to the investment, that the importance of knowing the investment needs. Um, but this would be a precursor to much more detailed studies um, to assess the, the investment needs um, d doing a much more detailed bottom-up analysis of uh, um, what are the types of technology, what are the population groups, um, and what are the sort of uh, service level sort of providers that um, need to be strengthened in order to provide services. So um, the, the hope is that uh, over the coming years, uh, many more countries will do a very detailed investment plan um, and, uh, and match that with uh, the, the, the financing available. Um, so yes, on the other side is the, to, to understand the, the, the funding needs. Uh, so the uh, tariffs um, are, are the, um, to be raised from the customer or the user. And in green is the, the public funds, the transfers and, um, available from bilateral aid and NGOs and so on and uh, the taxes which are allocated to, to uh, sanitation. And uh, obviously that's the difference uh, from on the left and the right side is the financing gap. Now th this model can be applied uh, at a provider level, a single provider level, or it can be applied at the entire sector level and anywhere in between. So th this, this uh, model is, uh, is, is useful for any level of the system. So um, now looking at how to close the gap, that, that's the analytical side, that's uh, sort of knowing where we are. How do we close the gap? 
And th there are a number of um, sort of uh, simplified solutions that uh, I'm going to present, and then we're going to have a few interventions from the floor. And w one of them initially, and this was really the message of the SWA 2017 high-level meeting, is that we really can't approach ministers of finance for more funding when we're not using the existing funding properly, when they aren't, we, we aren't um, dispersing it, or um, there's a lot of inefficiency in the system. And so we need to assess what are the, what are the sort of constraints, what are the bottlenecks. Um, and there are tools out there. There's the GLASS itself, which is the global level um, sort of monitoring instrument. And there also, there's a, also a country level um, tool called the WASH bottleneck analysis tool, which uh, many countries in Africa have already used and allows you to plan and, and cost how to remove the bottlenecks. And really critical as a starting point is to, um, after the financing gap analysis, is to write a financing strategy. How do you plan to close the financing gap? And we're going to hear from one or two countries who've done that. So um, one, one area of um, inefficiency is at the service provider level. And you can re um, actually reduce the investment needs by following a few sort of simple um, steps. And I'm going to show those in the next slide. Um, but it's also uh, many utilities have the potential to raise tariffs for those customers who can pay, as long as there are uh, mechanisms to assure the affordability of the service for those who are una unable to pay. So um, this is one of my favorite graphs at the moment. Uh, it was uh, a, um, a World Bank publication from 2016, um, not my own, um, which uh, shows how in four easy steps, <laughs> it's fairly easy, you can uh, go from, um, uh, you can increase the percentage of utilities that are recovering their operation and maintenance costs. Um, and these cover, um, if I can read. So um, what, what one, one measure is to increase, so I should say something about the data set. This is based on the World Bank's uh, IBNet uh, data set, the International Benchmarking Network, which collects data from thousands upon thousands of utilities worldwide and stores them in a database um, and analyzes them. And so based on these data, they could actually um, sort of model um, the impact of different measures. And what, what the first measure is to increase uh, bill collection rates to 100%. So, and so to uh, follow up on all those customers who are not paying. And th that increases the proportion of utilities um, globally that uh, w would cover operation and maintenance costs. Um, the second step is to reduce non-labor costs by 15%, and that increases further the um, viability of, of utilities. Um, the third is to reduce the current levels of non-revenue water um, to 25%, a standard 25%, which is not a high bar, but uh, it's possibly realistic. Um, and this has a massive impact on the viability of utilities. And then the final measure is to increase revenue, so we raise tariffs by an average of 10%. And so um, while, while this is a very simplistic analysis, I think it's just illustrative that uh, many utilities can achieve a, a, a good degree of um, financial viability on operation maintenance costs by implementing such measures. Now, I'm sure many will come back and say how difficult these measures are, um, but um, you know, th they have been done and, and, and su um, successfully by, by many utilities. So on the, on the right side of the OECD framework um, is the repayable finance. So um, part of the financing gap can be closed by um, repayable finance. That's uh, loans paid back at either commercial rates or sub-commercial rates, depending on who's, who's the lender. Um, and um, so one, one thing um, we, we know quite a lot about is that um, a lot of the public resources, pu public funds, are going to um, a, a, a subsidizing operation and maintenance costs of utilities. And so if utilities become more viable and less money needs to be channeled to the operation and maintenance costs of utilities, then it can be reserved to 
um, making um, repayable finance more of an option for utilities, for extending services, for improving services, and so on. Um, so um, we, we need to ensure better use of uh, public funds um, to leverage more private capital. Um, uh, w one other um, thing that can be done uh, at national level, generally, is to align um, donor funding and to, to pool it. So um, there are some countries where there's some pooled funds. We're going to hear from one country uh, uh, later. Um, in order to uh, really put more funds behind the national strategy and the national plan um, and to, to reduce uh, duplication and fragmentation of the system. Um, and uh, this, this point I already covered in terms of um, pr providing lo loans to service providers, but also households. These can be fully commercial in some circumstances, or the new term is a blended finance, whereby um, public or other money sort of helps leverage and uh, re reduce the cost of capital to make it more viable to, to lend to households who don't have a credit history. So th th these are some of the general solutions. Um, and r rather than make some concluding remarks, I think we'll go straight to some of these, um, these examples. And um, this, this is a bit of a spontaneous uh, part of the session um, because I've been talking to a few countries uh, over the last couple of days to ask them if they can say a few words about their financing mechanisms. So um, if they're in the room, we're going to have uh, um, intervention from Eritrea uh, Kenya, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, Zambia, uh, Senegal, and Niger. And these are going to be um, elevator pitches. Um, and uh, I've asked for a sort of one, one and a half minute intervention from these speakers. Um, imagine, uh, do we have any ministers in the room? Okay, so we don't have a minister to stand in front of you. But let's, let's say you are on an elevator with a minister. It's, let's say it's, let's be generous. It's a, it's a building in New York with about 50 floors. So you've got about a minute and a half before your elevator hits the ground floor. And um, we're gonna have uh, Didier on the timer. So when the timer goes, the elevator door opens and you've gotta make your final few, your closing arguments in a few words. Okay. So let's see how this goes. Um, so um, can we go in the order that I started? Is um, Dr. Zumoi, the Director of Environmental Health from Eritrea, uh, in the room? He is, okay. So um, we're gonna hear about um, Eritrea at the end of last year implemented the WASH bottleneck analysis tool. And this tool covers all the, the, the building blocks, but uh, He's going to say a few words about the, uh, some of the results and findings um, related to the, the financing. So, uh, Dr. Zomoy, please. Uh, yes, go thank ahead. you very much. As you have said, uh, Eritrea has uh, conducted the roadmap uh, December 2018. In this uh, roadmap uh, sanitation workshop, a number of participants, including uh, ministers, zonal uh, governors, sub-zonal administrators, local NGOs, UN organizations, and the community leaders participated. And uh, <clears throat> it was a good workshop whereby we, a kind of sensitization has been done to all the stakeholders. And uh, basically, it was funded uh, by UNICEF. And uh, <clears throat> during that time, what we have discussed is that we will make uh, costing analysis. We try to intervene in all the zones, in all the 54 sub-zones, and we'll go down to the uh, local administrative areas also. That means to the communities. So uh, detailed costing will be done in all these uh, interventions. And uh, in this regard, without passing to other interventions, we kindly request, 
request to the organization or yourself to recruit experts. As has been mentioned by the first speaker, the SWA uh, financing tools could not be finalized by ourselves unless and otherwise some kind of interventions by other consultants is being done. So basically, as you know, Eritrea is a resource poor country and uh, uh, we kindly request some interventions in the financial aspects also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Who's next? You you had a, your, your lift went into the basement because you had a bit of extra time, but um, we need to get a microphone onto the timer. So that, okay, so um, thank you, thank you very much. That's really hopeful um, and a, a good outcome, uh, one of the outcomes from the uh, washbat in Eritrea. So uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Kefa Ombacho from Kenya to say a few words about the financing plan and subnational costing um, in, in Kenya. I think it's just a follow-up of uh, the presentations. And I, uh, for us in Kenya, we have, uh, using the tools, we have the investment. And we know what uh, we require in the country in terms of uh, what, how much money. We know our gaps. We have also gone down to work for the counties. We have further also gone further to do some uh, analytic on the losses if we don't meet uh, the intent. But basically, it is upon the government of Kenya to be able to provide the funds, but unfortunately, these funds are not available, and we know that that's why we have uh, been able to calculate the gap. So we are relying on uh, a building partnership, strong partnership, and that means that uh, we are pooling all the resources for all stakeholders and how do we do that? We have one plan for the country because the population is the same, the country is the same. So we have one plan. So we have a buy-in from all the partners to be able to attempt to deal with whatever component within uh, the, the country plan. So that brings the total sum of amount of money within the country uh, with all the players. And that's how we are actually trying to cross the gap. Thank you. Wonderful. Wow. But, oh, you didn't even reach the ground level. So now you can ask the minister about how his children are and things like that. So that's, that's nice. I the think minister, so I hear. How are your children? I'm also representing my minister. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, the next speaker uh, is um, uh, Musa uh, Soko from Sierra Leone. Are you in the room, uh, Musa? I can't see because I got the lights in my eyes. No? Okay. So the next uh, is um, Ethiopia. So um, Kitka Goyal will, will speak on behalf of the government of Ethiopia, who couldn't be here, to um, talk about the uh, consolidated uh, funds in, in Ethiopia. Yes. Um, thank you, Guy. Um, just to say that the key um, partners in the sector in Ethiopia, the World Bank, Africa Development Bank, DFID and UNICEF came together and put money into a consolidated WASH account, uh, which is the pool fund that the Ministry of Finance administers. This money is then disbursed to the different sector ministries that are participating in the One WASH national program, which is the Ministry of Water, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, and the Ministry of Finance itself. Now, this money then becomes available to the government to utilize in the priority areas they have identified for themselves, including, therefore, institutional wash, one of those areas that is sort of least funded, and, of course, sanitation and hygiene itself. So we see the pool fund as one of those mechanisms that could easily become available to the government to fund um, these kind of uh, key sectors for water and sanitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, also, within time, thank you. I forgot to say that uh, 
I've, I'm, I'm leaving protocol behind and I'm not announcing uh, d director, um, um, director of Environmental Health, MOH, uh, Kenya, and uh, Chief of WASH in, uh, for UNICEF um, in, in uh, Ethiopia. Um, and we, we already have a discussion. Uh, the Ghana delegation is interested to come for a study visit to, to see how the uh, One Wash National Program and Consolidated Account works. So uh, that would be great. So the, the, um, the, the next um, speaker, if, uh, if she's here, um, is Mrs. Uh, Chola Mabilima um, from Zambia. Are you in the room? Yes, hello, over here. Um, so. She is the Senior Financial and Commercial Inspector for the National Water Supply and Sanitation Council, which is the regulator, and we'll speak a little about tariff reform and how to um, address affordability uh, in, in Zambia. Okay, um, so for us, um, we sort of uh, leveraging the tariff setting uh, system to actually try and see how we bridge the gap, but then we are aware that there are issues of affordability and willingness to pay so what we've done is we've come up with a mechanism that has inbuilt um, subsidies. So instead of relying uh, on government subsidies, we want to build in subsidies within the pricing among the different uh, customer categories. So we're looking at domestic, uh, institutional, and commercial customers subsidizing one another, and also looking at um, those that consume more, um, considerably more, to actually subsidize um, the low consuming customers so that uh, in that way we try and see how um, the financing gap uh, is bridged. So what we think is that with a well-structured uh, pricing mechanism, we can actually, you know, leverage a little bit more on the tariff as a form of financing in the sector. Wonderful. I think that's, uh, we're really looking forward to seeing the results from that and, uh, and disseminating uh, uh, across the continent because I think this is really, this cross subsidy is, is really um, the way forward, one way forward. Um, so the next uh, speaker, um, if Mr. Uh, Gouye from Senegal is, is in the room. Yes, yes great. From the uh, National, um, National Organization for Water and Sanitation and we'll speak about FSM, uh, Fecal Sludge Management Financing in, in Dakar. So yes. please, Mr. Gouye. Okay, uh, our experience in Senegal is that uh, since 2013, we do some delegation, uh, private-public partnership with the on-site sanitation sector, and some and one national company was, uh, you know, was leading and was uh, running this delegation with the ONAS partnership with ONAS, which is a regulatory company, and Delvic, which is which is a public, uh, which is private public private uh, private company, is the delegator. And since 2012 to 2013, we have in the pilot program. But now we are scaling up. Since 2018, we are scaling up this program. And uh, I just uh, have information, David, Delvic is also the winner of the tender we launched in the since, uh, last November. Mm -hmm. In fact, it will be a continuity. Uh, you will continue that job. And we have a mechanism which is very important for blending finance. That's what I would like to share with the people, the press participant. We have the a sovereign fund in Senegal, created since 2012. A guarantee fund also for the small and major uh, size enterprise, created since 2012. We have also a commercial bank, which is more interesting to on-site sanitation, because uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, support, we had a guarantee fund, which uh, funds the, the MTOs to get trucks and spare parts. And it, seems a very bit sick success now. And we have the mechanism blending finance in Senegal. This is a very good opportunity for us. And uh, when we, when, last year, I, I, I have a meeting with the general manager of these two companies, and they were very interested to support the sanitation sector. I think that we have good mechanism, financial mechanism in Senegal to develop sanitation sector and private-public partnership. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many good examples. We, we really have to make sure the, when you're ready with the results um, to show, we, we need to, to disseminate very, very broadly. Um, so the last uh, on my list is uh, Mr. Madugu in, from Niger. Uh, are you in the room, Mr. Madugu? Yes, great. So um, 
Mr. Madugo is from the Ministry of Water and Sanitation, um, and he will say some words about uh, lo loans to service providers um, and, and the recent addition of a guarantee fund in Niger. So please go ahead, Mr. Madugo. Merci. Uh, donc, uh, aussi au, au Niger, nous avons un programme sectoriel eau et assainissement uh, qu'on appelle le PROSEA pour l'horizon 2016-2030. Ce programme montre effectivement un important gap et on a mis en place un mécanisme commun de financement, mais le challenge reste la mobilisation des partenaires dans ce mécanisme-là. L'autre aspect, c'est que ce programme aussi met en évidence la nécessité du partenariat public-privé afin d'assurer le financement du secteur pour atteindre les objectifs que, euh, qui ont été euh, fixés dans le cadre de ce programme-là. Donc, d'ores et déjà, en matière de gestion des services publics, c'est les opérateurs privés qui, qui, qui le font. Et euh, depuis qu'ils qu ont commencé, en tout cas, la, la, la situation de durabilité des, des installations a commencé à, à, à s'améliorer. Voilà ce que je voulais dire pour l'instant. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci. Merci pour for your uh, uh, experience. Uh, so, I, um, I'm not sure how we're doing for time, but um, there are a couple more experiences on track then. Um, so, um, a quick experience from, um, uh, from, from Mali and from Ghana, just to give them an opportunity to explain. Um, so, also applying the one minute timer. Um, so, um, Mr. Um, Drisa Traore from the Ministry of Environment in, in Mali um, to say a few words about the TrackFin experience. Voilà, merci tout le monde. Moi, je me nomme Drisa Traore. Je suis conseiller technique au ministère de l'Environnement, de l'Assainissement et du Développement Durable du Mali. Le Trafin euh, bon, a commencé au Mali en 2012. Et comme les, tout le monde l'a dit, il y a une disparité en matière entre l'eau et l'assainissement, et à l'intérêt de l'assainissement aussi, entre les zones rurales et les zones urbaines. Donc pour combler ces gaps, pour, pour le suivi de les, le financement, nous avons fait appel à, au Trafin, financé par l'OMS euh, et l'UNICEF, pour les deux phases. La première phase a concerné l'eau et l'assainissement uniquement. La deuxième phase a intégré l'hygiène, la gestion intégrée des ressources en eau, le wash à l'école. Et donc, on est arrivé à la troisième phase maintenant. Mais l'innovation est que Didier a parlé de l'institutionnalisation. Nous avons mis en place un comité de pilotage qui fixe les orientations stratégiques et un comité technique qui pilote l'opération qui regroupe tout l'ensemble des acteurs, le ministère des Finances, tout le monde. Et ce comité a tenu des réunions. Nous avons fait un plaidoyer au niveau de l'Assemblée nationale pour dire, voilà ce que le financement de la, est réservé à l'assainissement. Comme les lois passent par vous, c'est à vous vraiment d'interpeller le ministre des Finances. Et je pense qu'on est sur ce plan. Je ne veux pas trop m'avancer. C'est ce que je pouvais dire à l'attention de tout le monde. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Um, please pass the microphone to uh, Niall Boot from UNICEF Ghana. Say some words about uh, data collection at local government level in Ghana. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, just to say that, that as Didier mentioned in his presentation, um, it was, it was uh, the, the first round of track fin in Ghana assumed 15% uh, of common fund, uh, like uh, the national level government dis distributions to local government were going, were being spent on sanitation. So we carried out a piece of work to test that assumption and found out that the, that the, the number was, was quite a bit lower than, than that, it, although it varied, uh, it, it, it was quite a bit lower. So we, we then engaged also with the Ministry of uh, Finance to one of the difficulties they had when they were collecting that data at the local government level was that they had to go through the cash books to really understand where money was being spent. And that is because the, the budget line for sanitation just said sanitation, which covered both liquid and solid waste sanitation. And most of the spending was happening on solid waste sanitation as opposed to liquid waste. So we tried to also engage 
uh, with, the, with the Ministry of Finance on, on creating separate budget lines for liquid and solid waste sanitation, and they've now done that. And, and uh, it's, it's the first year now that the, that the assemblies are using that in the guidelines. So that also helps us to engage with civil society on local level advocacy on how much uh, local government is spending on sanitation. So happy to discuss with anyone in more detail. Thanks. Okay, well, um, thank you. Uh, I'll pass. Uh, I, just one, one final word from me um, is that uh, at this um, SWA sector ministers meeting uh, in Costa Rica in uh, early April, um, there will be one ministerial dialogue on financing. Um, and uh, those countries that uh, are able to present uh, case studies and experiences um, via their ministers are really encouraged to do so. So um, this, uh, today was a bit of a warm-up, but uh, I, I think that those countries who have uh, shared today and, and others um, really have some very, very valuable experiences that can come out in the sector ministers' meeting. Thank you. Thank um, you very much. You, yeah. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, all those who shared their experiences at uh, country level. It leaves us with uh, a few minutes for questions and answers and... Uh, I welcome some questions. I think uh, all right, we start on this side. A few questions from here. Good. I'm seeing three. Uh, I think I can use Excuse this. Me. Is it working? Yeah. Very good. I see three hands here, madam, and then I will go there. Oh, quite a number. Let me take this side, and then I will jump to that one. Okay, I can start. Oh, somebody. I, I, okay, good, okay. good. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm Abdullah Boli from USID and uh, working in Senegal. First, I want to congratulate all the presentation and hope that they will send those presentations to us because it's very important. Uh, but I want to make a contribution, a statement, and ask a question for AMCAO. How much are we ready to change the game? Because I think that if we need to close those funding game, those funding uh, gap, I think we need to rethink how we are managing and also how we are running the project. INSEF presented a, a gap of $16 billion to reach the SDGs. But I'm a little bit thirsty or hungry about to know what is the assessment did to close the gap for the MDGs. We know that MDGs was reducing by half the number of people that are not gaining access to sanitation and water. But what is the evaluation and what is the lesson learned from MDGs before we go to the SDGs? And now my contribution is we can help the countries to be in the way of self-reliance. Because without those kind of self-reliance, if we want to continue to drive project by uh, project leading. It would be very difficult to make this game, uh, this game change. It's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Madame here. Merci. Ma question s'adresse à Monsieur Sarr, le premier présentateur. Uh, Je viens d'un pays dans lequel, du fait des réalités socio-culturelles et de la configuration de l'habitat, on, on utilise plus la notion de concession que de ménage. Donc, du coup, dans le cadre de l'évaluation de nos besoins en assainissement et des progrès, c'est, j'allais dire, c'est un accès limité parce que partagé. Est-ce que l'outil soit présenté peut nous permettre d'évaluer cet indicateur-là Merci. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen there. Sorry. Merci. Moi, je suis Monsieur Hervé Didas Christian Amboulou de la République du Congo. Ma question s'adresse à Fiona. J'ai compris qu'il y a certains pays d'Afrique qui ont mis en place l'outil Tracting, et j'aimerais savoir s'il y a des conditions et quelles sont les étapes à suivre pour qu'un pays puisse mettre en place cet outil. Parce que le Congo aussi sera intéressé. Merci. 
Ah, no, il y avait monsieur là-bas. Hello, my name is Jerome Rimmers from Simavi. Uh, my question is uh, for MCO, uh, if it would be possible to make this year uh, a, a plan for uh, the finance cap for the years 2020 to 2030 for all the African countries and uh, includes the ways how to finance and what's the finance gap and what is the demand for external partners. And maybe present it at a, maybe a, one of the international meetings later this year or whenever it's possible. But I think it's good to do that before 2020 that everybody knows what is the demand and how it's going to, to, to reduce the gap <laughs> or close the gap. Thank you, Madam. Merci. Je voudrais savoir aussi au niveau de l'AMCAO, qu'est-ce qui est prévu pour les prochaines années, surtout concernant le plaidoyer sur la mobilisation des fonds, d'autant plus que nous constatons qu'il y a des gaps en termes de financement. Euh, la deuxième question à l'endroit de l'Éthiopie, qui a développé un fonds commun de tous les bailleurs. Je voudrais savoir le mécanisme qui a été mis en place pour s'assurer que tous ces fonds qui ont été mobilisés et mis en, ensemble servent à atteindre les objectifs euh, visés. Merci. Good. Um, the last from this side. Mine is to request uh, Dr. Kanyangiri uh, that um, in Africa, this region, I think the big burden we are having in terms of uh, disease and in terms of investment, in the, especially in health, over 50% is things that we can be able to manage. But at the AU, I have never come across any topical subject matter, especially on this, which would turn around the investments and reduce the economics in terms of the wasted mon monies that we are spending in countries. My request, is it possible that this can be pushed at that highest political, regional political level, for it to be discussed and the commitments are made at that level? because we know what it will mean for this region. We got this side? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First of all, thanks, thanks for the presentations. Um, my name is Brecht Bommen, I work for UNICEF in Mozambique. And what we did in Mozambique, we looked at also the the investments made by government, where do they go? And in Mozambique, in rural, it's, it's, it's basically behavioral change and communities have to invest themselves into upgrading sanitation. If we looked at urban, most of the investments went into urban, reaching usually the rich. So my question is a bit like, uh, Guy, but you, your model looks very much around infrastructure and, and, and big systems. So, so my question is a bit like, how do we look how do we also support rural communities whereby the method is very much behavioral change and communities need to make their own investments? So how, how do we help them in financing that? And I, I think your presentation was very good on that. Like it was what, 50% or so was people doing it themselves. So how can we address that, that they can actually climb the sanitation ladder? Thank you. Okay, just near you. Ah, okay. Il a posé la then question. fine. Parfait. We have no more question. No, That's I very good. I know I went from this side. Now, good. Um, I will call upon uh, the presenters. Uh, probably they should have come this side so that uh, when they answer, they are seen. Um, I was not expecting questions to Amka. We didn't present anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Other presenters. I, I, I think while, while presenters are coming, I, I will say that um, very quickly, for, for AMCAO, if you ask us uh, to take lessons from MDGs, uh, lessons ha have been drawn um, from each country, and uh, we think that we know what didn't go wrong. Uh, the commitment, uh, we didn't take them so seriously and comprehensively, and this is, uh, I think, what we are doing. 
now uh, as we go to the SDGs. We are looking at all the factors which can lead to success and uh, pulling together all the um, meaning, means we can, we can get, including uh, capitalizing on this partnership we can, we can have, uh, put uh, all uh, the capacities, be it uh, technological, financial, and uh, all the uh, categories of stakeholders. I, I think um, we learned from our mistake and uh, from the score we received and we are trying to do better. Uh, I will not go to details uh, uh, on that. Um, I'm to do, um, to, to plan for, for an evaluation and a, uh, of, of what is needed for the years to come up to 2030. I think that is uh, a big endeavor. I would say, yes, we can do that with our partners, but uh, uh, what you have been shown is already a projection. Now we need to see what each individual country does and how it customizes, because that is what is really meaningful. AMCA as a secretariat or council of ministers cannot do it on individual countries because at the end, we are not the one implementing, we are only facilitating. And I wish immediately to go to the question of Madame. Uh, I think indeed our role is more to do that plaidoyer on resource mobilization. Once we know what is needed by countries and uh, we follow our, our, our strategy and how the countries will put that strategy in, implement it. And that is what we will do. We will do advocacy. We will organize donors conference and we will see those development uh, um, uh, partners, including uh, not only for grants, including possibilities of getting loans, guarantees for loan and uh, organizing the public sector and working with our ministers on how to create an environment which will give that confidence and trust I talked about in my introduction um, to this uh, workshop, because they need to be sure that money they will put in will be, will be, will, will be secured and will, they will be paid back. And um, also one thing I think we need to talk about is these differences in policies where, for example, uh, the local um, administrations are not allowed to invest and take some actions in, in the sanitation area because of the policies and how it is uh, legally established. I think this is, again, something which can be advocated for by AMCAO in our Council of Ministers to tell, for example, countries, I can name them because they were named here, like Senegal, where the collectivities are not allowed to do those things. I talked with local authorities here. They have that issue. I talked with uh, uh, the Pan-African uh, 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 a private sector for uh, uh, fecal sludge management, they need some legislation to be able to work and access money. So those are the things AMCA will do. And uh, of course, AMCA has started since last year to uh, advocate for uh, water and sanitation to be put top on the agenda uh, because it is uh, a, a sector which has not been given enough importance and uh, which needs it because it intervenes in the success of other different uh, pillars of African economy and the Africa Agenda 2063. And when I talked at the beginning that we will have the finance ministers, that we are talking about having a new summit on water and sanitation, it is with the African, water, uh, African Union because we want them to take that lead on uh, the political arena. So I think with those, uh, AMCA has responded now on technical basis. I will ask uh, my uh, colleagues, Afiona and Guy, uh, to come up with uh, some answers on questions which were targeted to them. Alors, moi, je vais très brièvement répondre à la question par rapport aux conditions et les étapes pour euh, mettre en œuvre TrackFin au niveau pays. Je crois que c'est très, très simple. Il y a une condition clé, c'est la volonté au plus haut niveau du gouvernement de prendre le, le leadership. Et, et ça, c'est vraiment euh, quelque chose sur lequel il ne faut absolument pas transiger. 
Euh, ensuite, il faut faire une requête euh, officielle pour qu'on puisse aussi mobiliser des ressources, qu'on puisse mobiliser des partenaires. On est à l'OMS une petite équipe, mais comme je vous ai expliqué au tout début, début on s'appuie sur nos partenaires, sur l'UNICEF, la Banque mondiale, l'IRC et nos autres partenaires. Et je dois dire, l'UNICEF est un de nos partenaires en Afrique avec le, le, lequel on travaille vraiment étroitement, euh, que ce soit tant au niveau technique, tant au niveau financier. Et, et vraiment, j'aimerais remercier euh, l'équipe de l'UNICEF qui nous appuie euh, autant. Euh, donc, voilà, la, la, la condition clé, c'est la volonté au plus haut niveau, ensuite une requête officielle venant du plus haut niveau, et ensuite on peut engendrer les, les recherches pour pouvoir euh, mobiliser les fonds et les partenaires. Merci. Uh, well, um, just a couple of quick responses. On the tool, um, if the data you have don't quite fit the data that are needed in the tool, um, you can go behind the sort of user interface and change some variables, but that needs some help from um, the tool developer um, in order to not make the wrong change. So if you've got, uh, if you want to give shared sanitation or sanitation to um, multi-family households, then, then it's feasible, um, but it might be worth um, uh, contacting me. Um, And then on the, on, the, on the framework, which doesn't really address rural communities, um, you know, I, I think it is partly the wording. I mean, I think the co concepts still stand. Uh, on the left side is investment. It's not just infrastructure. So that includes software. Um, so I think that we can just apply it and, and change the words for a rural context. Let's do that together. <laughs> okay, I think that... Um, that was Thank you very much. Uh, I will urge uh, the uh, participants here, uh, the, the, uh, Dr. Fiona and uh, Dr. Guy will be around uh, uh, during the few coming days. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, uh, ambush them and uh, ask more questions if they come. Allow me now to call upon uh, Dr. Kelly uh, to sum up uh, what uh, we take home after this very brilliant uh, uh, series of uh, presentations. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm. Okay, everybody, yeah, how's everybody doing? We covered a lot of terrain here. So a question before we end, how many people here are a financial person, expert, banker, economist? How many people who are here would consider themselves to have that background? So we have how many? Two? Two people? How many people? Three people? How many are wash people? How many of you say, what do you do? You're a wash person. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm also a wash person. So I think what is really important about this session is that Financing is such an important part of our sector. Um, and it's in sessions like this that we can really appreciate the expertise that we need from other sectors to be able to help us to achieve the SDGs. And I think we really are lucky in the sector to have people with these skills and expertise who are becoming WASH experts. But it also means that as WASH people, we do have to also engage ourselves in learning about the language and how this works because it's going to be a key part of our way forward. I think we've covered that we need to know our costs. We talked about the SWA costing tool. We've talked about the fact that we need to know where the funds and the financing is coming from. We saw the results of TrackFin and we, and we discovered that what we thought was happening isn't really what's happening, that six out of $10 are coming from the population who's paying for services. Um, we saw that half of the funds need to be used for operation and maintenance. So this is really important that we test our assumptions um, and that we have the data. I think the second half of the session, we talked about where the financing is going to come from. Um, I think what I took away from this is it's not going to come from one place. There's no magic solution that if we just do this one thing, we're going to suddenly get a hundred $114 billion dollars a year. I think what we saw is that we're going to need to do a range of things. We're going to need to use the money that we have better. 
we're going to need to strengthen the enabling environment in the sector. And I think this last point that Dr. Kanangiri made about the fact that some of the things affecting the finances in our sector depend on the overall country financial systems, um, like we were talking about with the decentralized ability of financing, you know, th that all of these things are going to be really important as we look at how we're going to finance uh, the SDGs. And I was really inspired um, by the countries that shared their elevator pitches, um, Eritrea, Senegal, Ethiopia, Kenya, Zambia, Niger, Mali, Ghana, Sierra Leone, I'm sorry if I missed anybody, but, but this is where the solutions are coming from. They're coming from you. You know your context, you know your country, you know what is possible, and w these are the kinds of solutions that are gonna help us make the steps in the right direction. Um, I just wanted to end on one point that I thought was really important. I think the lady from Zambia left, um, but I think we do in all of this need to keep in mind that we need to make sure that we reach uh, the poorest and most vulnerable populations um, and that we do address these difficult questions around affordability um, and uh, access uh, for the, the poor. So I think this was a really, really rich uh, session. Um, and, you know, of course, we're on a long uh, journey and a pathway uh, towards uh, financing the SDGs. But I think this was really uh, showing that we're going in uh, the right direction. So thanks, uh, everybody. and. Uh, I guess the good end of the the day. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it is a plan that I will uh, close. My closing remarks will have two um, major messages. The first one is to thank you all, presenters, to thank you, organizers, to thank you who have come to share your experiences, and to thank you all who have listened to it, who have taken that, those experiences, and I thank you in advance because you will take them home and try to apply them. The second thing is uh, that I have not talked to uh, these experts in finance, but uh, I know and uh, I have the trusts that uh, UNICEF, WHO, and some others of their partners are very close to AMCO and to the African continent. And they will certainly come and support anyone who will need a specific um, uh, 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 assistance in evaluating the needs uh, of how much money the country needs or, or the state or some other levels uh, to uh, fill the gap, uh, financial gap. And uh, AMCO has the role to be the bridge. If you write to us, if you can't write to them directly, write to us, make the requests, we will ask them. If we don't have, and currently we don't have that expertise, but we have that relationship, which will certainly bring the response to you. Don't keep yourself in a corner with uh, your issues and problems and some of the weaknesses. Weaknesses can be addressed through this partnership. And I call upon you to uh, call upon any assistance whenever you need it. I thank you very much. Wish you a very excellent evening. And uh, God bless you. <laughs>